have to click on anything, right? Oh, yeah, I do. Well, I guess and we're we live. Should, should be live. Yeah, we're Excellent. live. Well, for now, on Monday morning, the thirteenth of September. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. Thank you, those of you who watch after the fact and a handful who watch us on Monday mornings for our weekly podcast of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. This is episode number 29. That's over half a year. Let's talk turkey. Well, cosmology, astrophysics, got to make it understandable to most of you. My name is Baron Ron Heron, proud to be vice president of the club. We have an abbreviated uh, version this week, and we're also on YouTube. You want to leave a comment or ask a question, it's down at the bottom. You want to see past podcasts, go to sbau.org. It stands for Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, which is one of the few clubs supported by and usually based at our beautiful museum, which loans us their Zoom account to do this podcast every Monday morning. Someday when the COVID pandemic has been defeated, we will possibly all meet again. Right now, let's meet the, the Brain Trust. Your president, after three and a half years, on my screen, Jerry Wilson. How you doing? Hello. Sir? Good morning. Four years in office, huh? Two of those quarters. I don't teams. remember. <laughs> <laughs> He's married to a lovely wife, Pat Forgey. Uh, at the uh, top of my screen, it could be anywhere on yours, is Tom Totten, married to Suzanne, Tom, our webmaster, and past president, and a wizard. We're battling all kinds of things. Uh, we do not have uh, Tom Whittemore on board, but Bruce Murdoch is on the phone. We'll uh, get him off the phone. He's talking to the county, I guess, about something. We'll get to him in a few minutes. Chuck had uh, technical difficulties, and Tom Whittemore had uh, eye surgery. And so I guess we're going to welcome Bruce. Can you hear us, Mr. Murdoch? Are, are you there, Bruce? He's still muted at the moment. He yeah. is. You're, unmute yourself. There Hello, goes. Bruce Murdoch, BL. There we are. I'm now there okay. we are. It's an abbreviated oh. program of our podcast, our little blog for the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. This uh, week, we're down to three main points that I got from President Jerry's talking points. Everything you've ever wanted to know about Neptune, which is barely visible, well, in your telescope only, in the morning sky. And we're also going to talk about zodiac, zodiacal, zodiacal light. Zodiacal yeah, light. There you go. Zodiac I can handle, but zodiacal becomes very crazy. And then we well, have to put the emphasis on the right portion of the word. <laughs> Okay, but it is on the zodiac, right? So it's out there amongst uh, the. Country. Well, it's on the, the the zodiac is the plane of our solar system. I understand that. That's I know that. I yep. I grew up not knowing that, not realizing where the different houses, all twelve of them are, and we might also get into X-ray telescopes. We've sort of abandoned the nightly thing, but President Jerry, you might want to tell the folks that are watching and either now or after the fact where they can go to get those nightly viewpoints. From what is it, Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazine? Both both magazines are excellent, and both magazines um, have this week the Sky this week comments. Um, Astronomy Magazine they're a little more detailed, and that's the one I subscribe to. So, and I look at those for that's where I got the idea for Neptune tonight because Neptune is in opposition, and an amateur has or not an amateur, but um, the Hubble has taken this excellent picture of. Neptune um, from Earth, sure. which is a stunning picture. And I couldn't let that go unlooked at. And then um, we also have on the thing, I, I would like to start with X-ray telescopes as a topic, oh. since that will, um, um, we can, we might have a chance of getting Chuck back on board through phone call. When we go into Neptune, and I know he's got some good stuff about Neptune, so we'll give him a chance to find a phone number well on your travel notes uh, to us by email uh, mr president here's what you quoted in quotes if the scattered waves are in phase there's a peak in intensity of scattered electrons that totally lost me i don't know who uh, how does that figure in okay. and so that is not... key to all these that's key to the function of all telescopes um the uh, picture that i show there um, I forget where I got it from, 
but it okay. shows um, an atomic surface and it shows four atoms of the atomic surface. And it shows a light wave, two light waves coming in and bouncing, hitting the um, atom and then bouncing off at, in this case, a 50 degree angle. Now, what, it, what this means, um, light is an electromagnetic wave and it interacts with uh, atoms, with the electrical field of the atoms. And if the light waves wavelength is small enough that it can resolve the atoms in the surface, then it cannot perform the way we have visible telescopes perform, where light comes in and hits the mirror and then bounces straight back and forms an image. Because then the wave nature of the light interacts with the atomic spacing, which is about the same, or the atomic spacing is even bigger. And then you get this diffraction effect. So what the 50 degree angle there for reflection is because you see the waves coming off the atomic surface. You see wherever there's a peak, there's, a, there's another peak on the other one. So they build um, constructively. And that's the beam you get. You get a bright beam coming off at 50%, 50 degrees. If you rotate a little to another angle, then the, the phases don't line up and the beam cancels itself out. So that's useless for a telescope. So, and this works for um, radio telescopes too, but not with atomic surface, but in the dish of a radio antenna, the light wave coming in is very long wavelength. And so you can have holes in the mirror that are small enough that the light the light wave can't resolve radio it. waves. Excuse me. Yeah. Well, they're yeah. It's kind of I'm using it in a general sense of photon okay. waves. But you're right. The radio waves can't resolve the holes. So essentially, it's a flat surface, and you can bounce off it just like in a telescope mirror in the visible. But when you're trying to focus X-rays, you have these materials that you want to make the telescope out of, and you can't use them the same way we do. So um, we get these diffraction effects. So going to the next picture, um, this shows like an X-ray coming straight down. This is angle of incidence is the uh, uh, angle phi. And for normal incidence, the leftmost one, phi one, you see when this, this the light wave, the X-ray goes right straight through. And that's what you see when you, you get your bones looked at, the X-rays go right through. But as the <laughs> angle changes, the... Um, the index of refraction changes for the material. And finally, you reach an angle here. It's listed as phi six. And you see now it doesn't penetrate at all because the atomic surface is now at an oblique angle. And so the spacing between the atoms is now foreshortened and it appears to be very small. And now it's become significantly smaller than the X-ray wavelength. And so now it starts acting like an optical surface. That is, you can get out at phi seven, you can get specular reflection at these oblique angles because it hides the atomic spacing that would give you um, diffraction. So to make a Cassegrain telescope, the next one, you know, this is the design for that. It Cass shows income, incoming X-rays and two mirrors, and then you can Jerry, bring them Jerry, to a... Jerry, can I ask you, why would you call the Cassegrain telescope? I'm just about to explain that. Okay. So in a Cassegrain telescope, you know, you have a parabolic mirror that reflects light back up, and then you have a hyperbolic mirror that bounces the light back down through a hole in the primary mirror to your focal plane. In this case, we still have the, the leftmost mirror with an arrow pointing to it. That is a parabolic mirror, and the mirror on the right is a hyperbolic mirror. So this is the X-ray version of a Cassegrain telescope is what's shown there. Huh. So you can, you can do with these oblique angles, you can bring things to a focus like this. Now that is embodied in an actual X-ray telescope. And here you see um, the next picture. You can see that we have four nested paraboloids and that's the primary. And then we have four nested hyperboloids and that's the secondary, but we're always keeping it at very oblique angles, just glancing angles. So the X-rays can't see the atomic structure of the metals we use for this. The technology to do this is very proprietary to some companies. Um, there's various ways of doing it. Uh, you start with cylinders, solid cylinders, and you finish the out. Now, X-rays are very short. So the tolerances on these surfaces has got to be way um, better than anything we do in the visible, in the optical for our mirrors. So you make a cylinder. 
and then you coat it with a material. And then you take that material off and you um, somehow make it, you transfer that um, surface. What do they call that? When you, oh, it's a replica, a surface replica. And these mirrors are replicas of the solid surface that you figured. Um, and how you transfer that and keep that from um, flexing and distorting, um, those are quite proprietary in many cases. So, uh, and the, the main thing that prevents me from telling you about how they do it is that I don't know. But that's, uh, that's another story. Um, the, um, and that's technology. We're, we're here after physics and astronomy. So this is, the, this, this is a design that's used on the Chandra telescope, on the Chandra satellite to make an X-ray telescope. And then you have the X-ray detector back here with the focal surface. The next picture shows the Chandra um, satellite. Uh, I forget when it was launched. But it deploys a telescope like that, and it has the um, mirror high 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 resolution mirror assembly up in the front end on the left, and then it has the camera at the back. And it, you see, this, it's fairly long focal length. It's not a wide field camera. That would be quite Does a challenge. The, uh, is the center of the uh, front optics uh, absorb X rays so they don't illuminate the sensor? That's a good question, and I would assume so, but I don't know. I, yeah, that it makes sense that they do that. Otherwise, yeah. you have a consistent background fog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and then we go down here to things that the Chandra has looked at. Now, you've seen this picture before, I think, last week, because this is actually looking at an intervening galaxy acting as an X ray lens for objects in the early universe. And um, that object is not well understood, it's just been detected. The objects are either two growing massive, supermassive black holes or one such black hole and a jet in the early universe. So that's um, yet to be determined. So the Chandra is uncovering new mysteries. Mm. Also- oh, Gary, yeah. that Chandra, Chandra was launched in July, 1999. Okay, thanks, thank you. Uh, this is a pic. This is a, comp a superposition composition of a visible image, the star background, and then uh, fields of the um, greenish aqua frame is the field of the Chandra. Not this. Not this picture. The next one down. There. So this is a visible light picture of the sky, portion of the sky. And then the blue arcs are Chandra's X-ray vision of these um, superimposed on that part of the sky. These rings are created by light echoes uh, or X-ray echoes, a phenomena similar to the echoes on Earth from sound waves bouncing off hard surfaces. So these bounce as the X-rays spread out from the center, they hit a ring of material and then they bounce off toward us and we see it scattered off that object. And so these are uh, circular ring objects that are in space at some position, either in front of, at, or behind the emitting object. And they light up and, be, and, and become illuminated by the primary X-ray emission of whatever's in the center there. And then finally for this segment, um, this is really interesting. This is all really interesting. This is Abel 1775. It's a system where a smaller galaxy cluster has plowed into a larger cluster. So this is a collision of galactic clusters. So it shows elliptical galaxies, hot gas in smaller galaxy cluster. Uh, these are massive, massive objects. Um, but when they hit on this scale, they, they have very high energy uh, emissions in the X-ray. And these hard X-rays, they can also be considered gamma ray, but this is not um, a gamma ray telescope. That would be even more challenging than the X soft X-rays they're looking at. Any questions, comments? Don't throw anything. How big is this? How many light years across is it? Boy, I couldn't tell you that. That's probably a million light years across. Oh, wow. That big. Okay. It's, a, it's not a galaxy. It's a cluster of galaxies. Okay. Maybe they're really close together. I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't give the, uh, it doesn't give the uh, dimensions in where I looked. So, Jerry, what is it? So. What is the upper limit of the electromagnetic spectrum? Are they gammas or X-rays? Which is the most powerful? 
Gamma's, uh, gamma's. gamma's is the um, most highly energetic, the shortest wavelength, and it's also called hard X-rays. So it's two words for the same thing. Did so, I understand? There's that the, the Planck equation where E equals H nu, where H is Planck's constant, nu is the frequency of the uh, particle or the wave, and yeah. E is obviously the energy. So the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. Okay, but the frequency is represented in wavelengths that are a distance. What are, no, what are we see. talking about? Wavelengths are, wave, well, waves are in length, but frequency is in how many peaks of the wave pass you per time. How frequency many? times uh, uh, wavelength is equal to the speed of light. But it's number of times per second that it yeah, that the peak out. of the wave passes you. Okay, uh, we're not we're not talking wavelength uh, the size of an atom, are we? Because of yes, those that's angles? exactly the point. That's exactly the point. The X ray really? wavelengths are the size of an atom. That's why it's so hard to get to make a telescope that focuses X rays. You, you get tripped up by gamma um, by um, diffraction if you try and make a regular telescope because the wavelength of the X-ray is on the same scale as the wavelength of the atom spacing. So why that do makes, those, yeah, go why ahead. Do those, why do those atoms in the curvature, I assume, yeah, radio telescopes are curved just like uh, glass ones for vis visible light. Why do yeah. they have to be made of metal? What, what are metal atoms? Why do they do this to the X-ray and, and regular elements won't? Atoms, atoms have a um, collective cloud of electrons in the material that is not bound to any, elect to any particular nuclear site. So you have this sea of, of free electrons, and that, that gives total ref uh, reflection of the light. Okay, and my understanding is that atoms will take a photon and keep it, right, until it re-emits it or something, or, but that doesn't happen with x-rays? You're, you're talking it happens about with all of them. If you go back in pictures to the fourth one up, fifth one up, anyway, the one that shows the variable angles of, of uh, entrance of the lines going into the material. Okay. So... Um, um, let's see what, oh yes. Now you see, keep going back, Tom. You know, in the sun, it takes a hundred thousand years for photons that are created there. in the middle of the sun to get to the outside because they keep getting absorbed and re-emitted by the various yeah. atoms in the sun. Keep, is that what uh, it is? Go down one, there you, perfect. That's the one I want. So you see the, on phi four, you see, you go down, it hits the surface, and then it bends at the surface. The reason it bends at the surface is because the, the effective speed of light in the material is lower than it is in a vacuum. Now, if it's, if it's the speed of light is a constant at C, what the hell does it mean to have it be slower in a material? And it's kind of a trick uh, expression. It's a macroscopic effect. If you have, for example, an analogy I'll make, if you have, for example, a train in the old west out on the prairie, and it's going down a very straight track across the prairie, <clears throat> and the speed of train in this universe is 75 miles an hour, then that's the speed the train travels at when it's moving. But then it comes to a series of towns, equally spaced towns, and the rule is that it must stop for five minutes in each town and then start again. So it, between towns, it's doing 75 miles an hour, but in town, it's doing zero miles per hour. So the effective progress it's making is those little stops averaged with the speed it's doing between the towns. And that gives you a lower effective speed than the speed of train in this, in this scenario. Now, the atoms represent those towns. And when light enters a material, it wiggles the electrons in the atom and it wiggles them for a moment. And then it, the, if, if the atom doesn't have a, a, another atomic level to stop in, then it just wiggles and then it lets go of the photon and the photon travels on. So there's a very short period of time where the atom is playing with the photon saying, do I want to absorb this or not? And then it goes. So that's the equivalent of the train stopping in the station. So every time it comes to a layer of atoms, it has to get absorbed and re-emitted very quickly but it does give you an effective progress through the crystal of, a, of a, a slower speed of light. And that's what causes refraction. If you take a bunch of Cub Scouts 
and you have them all line up, um, say there's a hundred of them in a perfect line, and you draw a line across the dirt, and they all have their arms on each other's shoulders, and they march in step. But as they cross the line, which they all come to obliquely, they have, they've been ordered to take half the step they would otherwise. So they'll travel at a lower rate. Now, what will happen to that line as they cross this line? What will happen to that line of Cub Scouts as they cross? The line will bend. And that's refraction because the, uh, the step they're taking is half the size before they got to it. So it gives you um, a, a, a turn in the, in the line of travel. And that's refraction of the light due to the speed of light being slower inside the crystal. Now, the ratio of the speed of light in the crystal, not speed of light, but the effective speed of light to the crystal to the speed of light in a vacuum is called the refractive index of the material. So glass is typically 1.4, 1.2 or something, which means that you have um, a 20% loss in the speed of light in, the light in a crystal for making effective travel. But at the other end of the crystal, when it comes out again, then it's traveling at, at the speed of light again at sea. Is that clear as mud? The, the, the speed of the light actually decreases from 186,000 miles an hour? No, the apparent, the apparent speed of light decreases. Apparent, what's the difference? What are we talking about? I don't understand. The speed of light, it has, this train has to stop in each town very briefly. So it oh, looks like, traveling through this region where there's towns, it, it makes less progress. Okay, and refraction is different from reflection in that we're going through the material and what you're describing is those first five lines on the left in this diagram, the other two are reflected, aren't they? All of these, yeah, the, the, the final two are reflected because yeah. they, they are interacting with a, uh, a highly conductive plasma of free electrons in the surface. The other ones are actually uh, interacting with the atomic, uh, the whole atomic structure because they can resolve the atoms by going in at those non-oblique angles. Phi six okay. also has an evanescent wave that's going along the interface. Yes, it does. Yeah, now that's that's getting close to the Brewster angle. Oh but no, now, that's yeah. just no, that's just its. Um, yeah, you're right. It does. That's that is the Brewster angle there. Yeah, it's evanescent wave, total reflection. But this only happens with metallic uh, elements. It wouldn't happen with silicone or carbon or a layer of anything, uh, any other element. It does. Um, every element, many elements have free um, free electron plasma near the surface and or at the surface, and they can do some form of reflection. Metals have the really broad band, uh, you know, reflection over the like aluminum reflects over the whole visible wavelength but it drops off in the infrared. If you want to make an infrared telescope like the, what is it, the James Webb, you want to coat it with gold. Gold has a much uh, better reflection uh, in, the, in the infrared than aluminum does. Do you happen to know gold's number on the uh, atomic, uh, what do they call it? The uh, periodic table. Periodic table, isn't it a low number? Um, it has nothing to do with it, the number of protons and electrons. No, it depends on whether the outer shell is half filled or full or full. Outer shell. The outer, the outer electron shell for the atom. If it's um, if it has if it needs two electrons in the outer shell and it only has one, then it'll be a, a metal. But something Is like that, uranium would add shells everywhere, wouldn't it? It'd be almost yeah, like but a, it's whether the atom will give up the electron in the outer shell to the common uh, material, or whether it will um, keep it for itself, or use it, or use it for binding to the neighbor. And so, something about those right-handed reflections from X-rays manages to coalesce into a a picture that's big. Uh, I, I, how do they do that? Why, why wouldn't it just be splattering of these x-rays all over the whatever it ends up? It's, the back is not a mirror. Are we talking about the mirror? Mirrors are on the side, right? Inside. Right. Can the focal point is a detector. A detector. Just, just like the film in a camera. Oh, okay. But it's, it's, not, a, uh, uh, it's not like glass is used, uh, coated with something for you guys that watch visibly. 
that could be, that was that was used for um, X-ray detection for many years in the medical industry. Now they use cadmium telluride uh, semiconductors to absorb and detect the X-rays. And you said earlier, Mr. President, that uh, the uh, wavelength is about the size of an atom with X-rays. Yeah. How small are the wavelengths in gammas? They, um, you're probably not going to see a gamma ray telescope. Um, well, I guess as the technology gets better, you can use the same technique to X-ray gamma rays, but, or to uh, focus gamma rays. The, um, what was I going to, there was a... Uh, you certainly don't want to use them in the dentist's office. They would probably fry your tooth. <laughs> oh, no, the, the, the detectors now for X-rays have gotten so sensitive that you get a tiny, tiny fraction of, of the amount of X-rays you used to get. The really killer stuff, I don't know if you remember this or not, but back in the 50s and before, you used to be able to go into a shoe store and try on some shoes, and then you could stand oh, in yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. and you could, you could look uh, at your feet in X-rays. And really? See how, how your foot was in the shoe. Yeah. It didn't mean a damn thing. It was to a fluoroscope. Know. Yeah, fluoroscope. And uh, those things, that gave you a whopping dose. And a lot of those people that did that have ended up with foot problems for the rest of their lives, if not oh, cancer. Really? Foot yeah. cancer? Foot cancer. No, they get their foot stuck in their mouth. There's also something. <laughs> they, there's they also became something. politicians. There's also something I've seen only in movies, and I can't imagine it, and that's actually a moving skeleton, a person walking, and you can see them. That's, that's got to be a hell of a dose. That's CGI. That that's yeah, computer, was, computer graphic. Com computer generated images. Yeah, that's it. Fine. Thank you. Well, I'm talking about a moving uh, x-ray, not just a, a shot, but in the movie with... Uh, um, Arnold called Total Recall. Yeah. He walks behind a big screen and you yeah, see. Don't believe everything you see in a movie. Well, I thought that was based on something that actually existed. It exists that I never. Yeah, it existed in the memory of a computer. Yeah. So, oh, my. I didn't know about the, the foot in the shoe thing. That sounds interesting. That must have made lots of problems. It's deadly. Well, do you want to um, go to uh, looking at Neptune? Or are they doing that sure. with an X telescope? They're not looking at Nep Neptune doesn't admit x-rays, does it? Um, they all do a little bit. The, the major action with um, the planets that we have is um, uh, infrared. A lot of these big planets are hot inside because of the collapse of the structure, the formation of it, and they're still cooling off. Like Jupiter emits more radiation than it receives. So it's obviously still cooling off from the... the well, don't they have a radioactive core also? Well, everything has a little bit. That's, you know, back in the 1800s, um, Lord Kelvin estimated the age of the universe. I'm mean, not the age of the universe, the age of the earth by figuring out that it was molten one day. And he figured out for a solid sphere that's molten, how long would it take uh, in years for that to cool off completely and get to the stage it's at today? And he was way short of the mark. Um, what he didn't know and they didn't understand at that time in the 19th century was that we have radioactive elements in the earth that are continually adding a source of heat that he didn't consider. He thought it was just cooling off from primordial molten rock, but we actually have uh, radioactive elements in our earth and in the core that is supplying a small amount of heat. Hmm. Radioactive so, means emitting radiation as opposed yeah. to just being under a lot of pressure and still molten and yeah, Maybe it's, it's, different it's a things. different source. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of those gas planets. Here's what I learned from your notes about Neptune. This is fascinating stuff. Discovered first discovered in 1846. It's a cold, lonely planet out there. It's the farthest from us. It's 30 AU's away. It's 30 times uh, distance from the sun as we are, and it just completed one orbit since yeah. its discovery. I think that's. Freaking fascinating, 165 years around the sun. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess you're going to be out watching it? Uh, I, I like looking at, at Neptune in my scopes. It's, a, it's nothing, the image that I get visually and photographically, of course, is nothing like these photographs. But you can just see it as a slight bluish disk. Uh, you can just, it's just big enough. It's about three arc seconds across, usually. And 
um, if the seeing is anywhere reasonable, you can just detect the, that it's actually a disc and not a star. Uh -huh. So it, it's a magnitude, magnitude 7.7. .7. Uh, you can see visually to six magnitudes uh, if you're under super dark skies, maybe six and a half. So it definitely takes a scope to find it or see it. Do you see it's blue? Uh, you, uh, you can detect a slight blue color. It's hard to talk about colors in a visual telescope because the dim light level, your eye does not respond to color. Color is a phenomenon in your eye of bright light. Um, but Neptune is bright enough under the right scope that you can detect it's slightly bluish. And Uranus is slightly greenish. There it is. Well, Uranus is a lot easier to see also. Yeah. What, is, what did you say, Bruce? I missed the first part I of it. I said Uranus is a lot easier to see also. But it's not blue, is it, technically? It's kind of greenish. Yeah, it's not as blue as Neptune, but I perceive it. I was going to pull up a picture and send it to Tom for display here of uh, <clears throat> when we were at Westmont and I photographed one of the uh, lunar eclipses. Happenstance, Uranus was in my picture, and I found it when I did the you know the after the photo the uh, you know the photo. I, uh, I went over the pictures later, and. Uh, because the moon was a blood moon, it wasn't really right. So you could really see Uranus, it stood out. And it was off to the side of the darkened moon? Yeah, it was down around eight o'clock. Um, Mr. McPartland, I was gonna introduce, but he had a technical problem and he, he was starting to tell us about uh, this planet what we're looking at, even though you can't see it with the naked eye, it's supposed to occult a star which you can watch through a telescope. And he does that occulting thing. We're going to get a report from him. If uh, Chuck could, uh, can figure out a way to phone call us, since his uh, little Zoom connection is not working, maybe he could tell us about that. I learned about, uh, are they called arcs? Uh, these are rings that have names and the clumps are arcs. Should spread out evenly. Let me uh, quote from President Jerry's talking points. They got names for the five rings around Neptune. There's Gaia or Gale, Le Verrier, Lassell, Arago, and good old Adams. And Adams, the yeah. motion says clumps that are among these rings. There's clumps of what? Matter, dust? Jerry, what um, do you know? About whatever that? the ring is made out of uh, could be ice, like the rings of Saturn, um, dust and ice. The um, clumps... Um, uh, under one view, the, the clumps are unstable and they should spread out into becoming part of the ring, but they don't. So they are stable. And there's speculation that there's a couple of moons out there that are holding these things in their lumpiness positions. The, I like the way the lumps are labeled. They're labeled obviously by a French um, astronomer, Liberté, Égalité, and Fraternité, uh, Liberty, equality and fraternity, the catchphrase of the uh, French Revolution, right there. Um, and courage. Courage. So added that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and this sort of phenomenon doesn't happen uh, on the other gas planets. You don't see them among Saturn's rings. No, you don't see them among Saturn's rings. There's no visible lumps. But if there, there's, there are probably, possibly. Um, there are variations in density in those things. They do see a phenomenon where it looks like there are radial spokes sometimes in Saturn's rings, where material is electrostatically floating above other material. Ring dynamics is, is very tricky, I imagine. Um, it's, I, when, I, when I look at the, the dynamics in the papers on this stuff, I, I, I see a potential for really nasty uh, undergraduate mechanics problems for the students. I'm trying really? to figure out some of this stuff, yeah. Well, um, well let's see now, the, the, uh, what was I gonna ask the, about the rings? Um, oh, the moons. Yeah. Well, we, we don't have a total number of moons. The only probe that's ever visited the planet is Voyager 2, isn't it? Yeah, and it went whipping by, so we didn't get a really good count. But if they put something in, law, in orbit around uh, uh, Neptune, I'm sure we'll start running up the moon count. Aha. Uh -huh. So how many do we know of now? Um, I don't know. I think it used to have 
considered to be, it's not listed in what I looked up, but I think it's, it was in the range of five or something. There, he's got a good picture of it right there with the black band on it. One, 14, two, 14 known moons. Okay, 14. Okay. Back in the That's 50s, it used to be five, I think. But there might be some undiscovered ones that are like shepherding these rings. These yes. five rings. There might be a lot of, I mean, look at how far Saturn went. If Saturn has, what, 80 or 90 rings? I nope. mean, uh, moons now. 82, I think, Saturn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you count everything going around our Earth, including debris, we have about 7 jillion moons. I'm not yeah, sure. Most a lot of them are man-made. That's true. <laughs> most all of them are. But they have all these names for these. The rings have names and the uh, arcs, liberty, as you say, equality. Fraternity, could that uh, that early astronomer see those rings from? No, he could if, they, if they had good good enough telescopes at, and there was an occultation where Neptune was going in front of a star, they could see the star wink out or fade before it got to Neptune and then afterwards, and they would have speculated. They would would have been able to infer that there were rings there too. Ah. So, but they did not view them directly. I think they were viewed for the first time by, by um, Voyager, maybe. Well, we had occultation measurements too, I think. That's what Chuck was gonna talk about was the, the Neptune is going to be occultated, is gonna occultate a star and someone they're gonna, his group was gonna look at it with um, filters that would look at the methane to see if they could see a, a methane line end up in the star's spectrum, I think, or they had a filter on or something. Uh, Anyway, I think I've garbled his explanation enough so that That's, we'll hear sounds it good. when he gets back on. Well, maybe he'll call us and tell us. Uh, my question's about those, those things that are in the atmosphere, the icy stuff, which they say mostly is methane and ammonia, uh, yeah. water. Those are three compounds. The methane and ammonia, aren't they based on carbon? Aren't, um, they, aren't they organic? Uh, material or uh, they are organic but um, uh, my organic chemistry is not up to speed right now as I try and think about it um, well carbon melt NH NH4 is ammonia so there's no carbon in that I think that's ammonia um, ammonia is not flammable with oxygen I don't know it stinks I usually run away from it I never trade it. <laughs> I try and uh, I tried it's a cleaning compound I light it yeah well, that's um, ammonium hydroxide. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's the densest. So it's mostly hydrogen, helium, and methane yeah, in the atmosphere, and okay. it has, like the other ones, it has uh, no, um, it has no surface, no solid surface. Right. Yeah. We'll never be able to land on Neptune. No. They think, they think there's a super hot water ocean down yes. below, all the way down to yeah. the core. Well, I don't know about to the core, but at some layer in there, and it's uh, super hot, but it doesn't boil out of the atmosphere and go away because the pressure holds it in of the lighter elements above it. This stuff that, is on a massive scale. And that core, which is number four on this diagram, is about the size of Earth, right? Uh, yes, about that. It's got a rocky core. Neptune could hold about, what, several hundred Earths? Um that let's see what's its diameter compared to earth i think it's four times the diameter of earth okay so i think so it's more 16, like... 16 earths or something yeah. Oh. yeah okay well then that core should be a little bigger than this photograph i would think you ought to cube the diameter to get the volume difference yeah so it'll be 64 times yeah but it's That's the better. densest of the four gas planets how do they know that do you suppose oh because um you can measure the you can measure the mass of an object by if, if you can see something orbiting it, because the orbit size and shape is determined by the mass and the mass distribution of the object. So okay. by looking at by and by measuring Voyager two as it went by, we can tell how how much uh, Neptune weighs, and we can measure how big it is um, by just looking at it, and so we divide the um, mass by the volume and we get the density of the material average density and its density is much higher than saturn saturn of course is so light that it would float on water if you 
had a bathtub big enough. But then yeah. there's, is anyone going to complete the joke? <laughs> Better leave a big ring. Yeah. Yeah. Leave a big ring. A bunch of rings. <laughs> Well, why do you suppose they have a, a conjecture that there might be life down on in that ocean that's boiling or hot or whatever in, in Neptune? I, I didn't see that there was anyone projecting life might be there. Um, I think that it's it's the whole planet is inhospitable to life as we know it. The um, yeah, but so you know the tube worms that they found at the bottom of the ocean near the volcanic uh, the black bellowing yeah. vents blew them away. They didn't think that could happen. Yeah, they did. You know, so maybe well, I'll get blown away, but um, the, the the moons that have oceans on them, like and this asteroid, like Ceres and yes. Europa and Ganymede, these things, or was it Callisto? But anyway, they have um, oceans in them, and there's speculation that it might be there might be life down there of some sort, of some basic sort. So, well, it's how it gets kicked into. Uh, evolution i guess it's that's the amazing part yeah well i will never be able to land on any of the gas planets will we to check it out uh, you, you know you know the there's a little um video by uh that's narrated by some words of carl sagan and called voyagers i think it is it's about a two minute video <clears throat> very inspiring but they show people um on in planets that are the like neptune and uranus and stuff but they're in uh, giant airships that float, uh, landing on those planets and Venus too. There's speculation we might want to do Venus that way because the upper atmosphere of Venus is, is not the hot caustic acid of the lower atmosphere. So oh, possibly yeah. airships that float in these atmospheric planets um, might be an exploration thing one day. Maybe it'll be the, the next um, um, cruise uh, fad is to cruise the oceans of Neptune or cruise the atmosphere of Neptune. They even conjectured some animal life floating in those atmospheres, even in Venus. Yeah, that's been, that's, uh, that's been, that was based on a spectroscopic analysis, I think, and it's been debunked now, as far as I've heard. So, but the life in the atmosphere of these planets has been a staple of science fiction since uh, the fifties, I think. Well, your notes say that, uh, like many of the other gas planets, if not all four of them, they were formed close to the sun a long time ago, the beginning of the solar system, about four and a half billion years, and somehow went past us, if we were there, forming two, the rocky planets inner, and went out to the outer parts of the solar system. Where it I'm now is. Huh? I'm at a loss to understand how that could happen, but maybe a big well, star went by. Things form at a certain place in the in the primordial cloud, and depending on how much material is around there, but that mass orbiting at a certain distance with the other masses that form may not be stable. So, over a period of long period of time, some of these masses they all do a dance and and go to a more stable configuration. <clears throat> There's casualties along the way. You know, the Earth, the primordial Earth, was hit by another planet called Theia. Uh, which we believe gave us the moon. And there's speculation that Venus may have hit by something too. And that's why it has such a slow rotation. The collision took the rotation out of it and left it sort Did of it rotate static. backwards. Uh, very slightly, I think. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Retrograde. Yeah. So a lot of things have happened. The It was, uh, I guess, the uh, early, un early solar system I've heard was more of a shooting gallery than a stable system well it, what boggles my mind is to get from the inner to the outer and then get in a pretty nice circular orbit it's it's why wouldn't it be in a big vast weird oval oblong parabolic whatever there, there may be certain things that got okay. into those orbits and then they got thrown into a hyperbolic orbit and they're no longer with us as a rule isn't it pretty orderly though the eight planets and everything else the asteroids yeah, on the time scale of us uh, things are pretty orderly, but if you start expanding very long time scales on the order of hundreds of millions or billions of years, you can get some significant motion of these bodies with respect to each other. Well, in 1989, Bruce, Bruce is the expert on that. Bruce, what's anybody? that? On the uh, stability of long-term orbits in the solar system. Are they pretty close <laughs> to circular? <laughs> 
I know. They aren't because, mm -hmm. you know, only a uh, tube system you can uh, predict from it, but Kepler, if it's been in that, because of the inverse square of gravitational pull, there are no closed form solutions to, well, therefore you have uh, two planets that are uh, two suns close to each other and the third planet way out, but you get to, you know, something the size of the solar system. The, the simulation we did was 39 bodies. Uh, they, they move all over the place. For example, the um, locus of the sun over, I did it for a million years. It moves around twice the diameter. It's a big, you know, locus of, uh, of position. And likewise, our moon, it moves in and out. We, we know that, you know, just from observation. Huh. So, no, there's, there, yeah. they aren't in stable orbits. Oh, they're stable, but they're um, certainly not uh, yeah. uni uh, uniquely predicted, right? One of the most interesting things about Neptune, before we move on, is that it has a magnetic field that is 27 times more powerful than the Earth. So if you set up a table setting on your patio furniture out back, when we and we had that magnetic field, all your silverware would line up for you pointing at North. Is there? A, isn't it off a kilter too? Doesn't it? Isn't it tipped? It's tipped um, about 47 degrees compared to the planet's rotation axis. Okay, there's the path of Neptune. Well, ours is, tip, is tipped 14 degrees of the spectral yeah. orbit axis right now. Yeah. Does it have, is its North Pole, both of, both ends of North and South Pole, are they on the ends of the axis that it turns on or is it No, the, the, the rotational axis and the magnetic axis are not aligned. They're off by some, I think that's the 27 degrees I quoted. But what's showing now on the screen is currently the reason that Neptune is being talked about <clears throat> is that it's in opposition right now. And Tom is showing the finder chart for where it is in Aquarius on the border between Pisces and Aquarius. Um, and so it shows between September 1st and September 30th, that's where um, Neptune will be. And the little bar down at the lower right shows one degree. That's the typical um, field of view of most small scopes when you first put a 25 millimeter eyepiece in and you're looking around for things. You could put two full moons in that, couldn't you? Yes, you could. Now, here's a question I would have of Chuck if he were on, and maybe you know the answer to this. And this harkens back to last week and the week before we talked about uh, Einstein rings and gravitational lensing. Why wouldn't a Neptune, for example, which has some gravity, going in front of a star suddenly make us see a ring around Neptune that was that star. Do you understand the question? Say it again. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we get a little bit of a bending? All it takes is a little bending and that whole thing. Yeah. It's not the effect, off. first of all, we're too close to the planets in our solar system. The only thing that we stand a chance of seeing even a minuscule amount of bending around is the sun. And any of the planets are way too they don't have nearly enough mass to produce a, a noticeable bending of the light rays. Oh, really? Yeah. And just with the sun, it took microscopic, a microscope to compare the position of a star to its neighbors uh, in the um, 1919 eclipse photo taken by Arthur Eddington. Um, well, here's my counter comment about what you just said. Yeah. A gravitational assist. How yeah how we're, how we're uh, throwing our probes into faster, they go in close to a Mars or a Venus yeah. or a Jupiter and they're getting flung off in a different direction, yet yeah. it won't affect light rays? Oh, it, it does affect light rays, but light rays spend so little time next to the planet because they're traveling at the speed of light. But our oh. satellites, our probes, they're traveling only about, uh, what, 30 or 50,000 miles an hour. That's nothing compared to the speed of light. So they, they, they dawdle around those big planets. So naturally, you're going to see uh, the gravitational effect on them. Gotcha. Well, the only thing... You know, they actually get a little bit of energy from the planet right. as they go around it. But that wouldn't affect uh, light. It stays at the same speed. Even yeah. if it's been coming yeah. 13 billion years from the other side. Yeah. As far as we can... As far as we know. Yeah. The only other thing we can talk about on Neptune before we go over to uh, Zodiac light is uh, the big storm 
um, oval storm detected in 89 that went away and there's others that, that, that was black supposedly but the, the ones we see now are white spots and yeah. uh, is that the planet with the really fast winds yes this last planet has uh, what 1200 mile an hour winds there it is look at that yeah. that's a storm in the middle that white and that the dark the white but the extra dark in the middle that's the great dark spot Okay, and is it basically doing the same thing the red spot's doing on Jupiter? I don't know. I um, it is a storm, and Jupiter is a storm, and this is probably a storm. So, but the contrast is very different because the composition of the atmosphere is very different. It's more and evenly mixed. <clears throat> and how get, do you... you don't get the paint palette effect that you get on Jupiter? Okay, we had the diagram earlier showing the levels of deepness, and I guess that atmosphere we're looking at, the top of is blue, yeah. goes down probably most of the way more than the Earth is. You want to talk about zodiac light, gentlemen, before we go? Zodiacal light. What's it called? Zodiacal light. <laughs> zodiacal, I guess. Or zodiacal. Zodiacal, yeah. Uh, apparently, it happens that it heavies up twice a year, spring and autumn, and then. Um, it's most summer. easily. It's there all the time. It's most easily observed. Uh, right now, it's most easily observed in the morning sky. In the um, spring, it's most easily observed in the western sky. The um, but it, it exists. There's a nice picture of it that Tom is showing, um, and it's this is just be, after sunset or before sunrise in the autumn. If you look at the next picture down from that, it shows the Milky Way in the sky, and then it shows the zodiacal light going completely across the sky from horizon to horizon. The zodiacal light is a um, cloud of dust and crap in the solar system that populates the ecliptic. So we're always in it, we always see it, um, but it's very faint and diffuse. It's very dim, but on sometimes you can you can see it. It gives you the effect of a rising or setting sun. So they call it a false dawn or a false dusk, you know, false sunrise or false sunset. So um, they're very small particles, 300 micrometers to one nano, 300 micrometers, yeah. So um, the Pioneer 10 spacecraft- That's a lot of micrometers. Yeah. The particle <laughs> size is between 10 and 300 micrometers. Okay, can you see it? Would it be like a grain of sand on your finger? Um, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure you, I wouldn't see it. And I, why not? I, you know, I'm, my eyes are getting older, but. Um, the, the diameter of a human hair is about 100 micrometers, yeah. micrometers. Okay. <laughs> micrometer is an okay. instrument. Oh. <laughs> okay. And these are the source of some of our meteor showers, or that's different? That's comet. These forward. are probably a little on the small side to make meteors that you'd see. But collectively, but one, they reflect. Collectively, all these little small micrometer, barely seeable, reflect back enough sun to give us this light. Yeah, so, so wow. you can see it, yes. The um, fastest, those real fast um, meteor, uh, meteors that you see in the sky at night, like a real, like white and just zip, it's gone. Those things are about the size of a grain of sand, which is bigger than these 300 micrometers, micrometers. Okay. <clears throat> those are left over from comets, mm -hmm. the tales of comets that we've gone through. Yes, and a lot of this is from that. A lot of this stuff is from the tales of comets. Oh, it's just a lot of dust out there, and it comes from things that are in the ecliptic, and that's why it occupies the ecliptic. Is it solid, or and it's always there, and therefore it's harder to see stars that would be past the ecliptic uh, as opposed to looking straight up. Yeah, if you're if you want a, a real dark sky at night and like the picture that's shown here in Chile of the um, the very large telescope, the um, it can be very irritating trying to see something through that glow there. <laughs> so um, it, it's it's an effect by itself. Yes. Yeah, and we're ticked off at Galita for installing those new LED street lights. <laughs> uh huh. But that this is nature's pollution of the sky, of the light yeah. pollution, not ours. Amazing. 
Uh, and we did talk about this before. It's um, seen best during twilight after sunset in the spring, before sunrise in the autumn. Do you know why that is, Jerry or Bruce? Well, that's just because of the ang the the, the um, position of the sun relative to us. But there's another kind of light in the sky called the gegenschein. And yes, that's, it's related. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's related to this, but it's uh, opposite the sun. It's light reflecting. Okay, so this is in the direction of the sun. So this is uh, scattered light as opposed yeah. to reflected, reflected light. When it's, oh. Yeah, exactly. Sunlight. Yeah. yeah. Interplanetary. The particles, yeah, can reduce in size by collisions, by space weathering. Um, so we're talking yeah, and, about. And it, there's another point here that when the particles, they can wear themselves down by collisions. And so they become smaller and finer because there's a lot of them up there grinding against each other. When they become fine enough, the solar wind is capable of blowing them away by the radiation pressure. So, <clears throat> and that dust is, they say, is, is replenished by infall from comets. Also, uh, asteroids are our source. Is that yes. true? Yes, that's true. Uh, zodiacal dust around nearby stars is called exozodiacal dust. Okay, Baron, say that. E exozodiacal dust. In his oh, orbit. good. Yeah. You got it. Um, I'm said it fast why, 10 times. Yeah. I'm wondering why the, the asteroid <laughs> belt, does the asteroid belt represent sort of a larger version of what we're talking about, an obliteration, or are they too far apart, all those rocks? The well, there's, there's, there's a, we had a talk at the, at our uh, monthly meetings about a year before we disbanded because of COVID, the, um, that talked about these, these names of things from planets to dwarf planets, to asteroids, to meteoroids, and down to zodiacal dust and stuff. These are artificial categories. There's basically a continuum from large to microscopic on the atomic scale out there. And so these, they're all related. Um, asteroids, if they have ice on them and they produce a tail and they're a comet, if they lose all their ice, they become an asteroid. Um, these things, asteroids can run into each other and create a lot of dust and smash. And that dust becomes new zodiacal light particles. So they're all related. That's just how big they are, but they all come from each other. Well, speaking of that, uh, isn't Mercury almost a dwarf planet by size? No, the start of a planet, it's the, the key thing for the dwarf planet that got Pluto knocked out is that it, just, it doesn't clear its own orbit. It has so many other things that are, it's part of a group of, of planets. Mercury is all by itself there and, it, and it's big enough that it can pull itself into a sphere. So those two things qualify it as a planet. Okay. Well, Jupiter can't clear its orbit. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. You know, I've, the, heard, I've heard that argument before too. So there's the, the, I've also heard that the definition of planet and dwarf planet is being reconsidered because of all these uh, nitpicking details that uh, but we have not thought of. And Pluto may be back as a planet and Ceres may be back as a planet. Ceres is the only one in the asteroid belt big enough to have made a globe. Yeah. Here. Yeah, there are no others that size. Wow. You suppose everything else used to be dwarf planets? They just got knocked around and hit like cue balls and fragmented up into little ones. <laughs> and then the ultimate, the ultimate would be that zodiac light. All those little, what do you call them? Micrometer, micrometer size, micrometer. barely yeah. seeable. Well, micron is the actual term. Well, micron is, is a, a micrometer. Is that in the uh, the version of nano? Nano is small too. Out in nano That's is a thousandth a thousand, of a micro. Right, oh, a thousand God. times lower than micro. Oh, it is. That's yeah. really small. Well, this has been fascinating. Then, yeah, picometers. That'd be a thousand times smaller than that. What are you guys mm -hmm. going to be doing with your telescopes, Bruce? What are you looking at these days? You going up on Camino Cielo again? No, because the uh, Forest Service, the roads are closed. In fact, we did do that, uh, Charles Schuler and myself. Because uh, okay. you look at the uh, Google Earth view, some big areas there you could set up. They're all behind uh, fences, private property. 
Uh, and it was also just a wind tunnel up there, really, really windy. So we ended up going, there's a place we go, which is uh, not quite as far as the uh, uh, Hondo Bridge, uh, that old, it's still, you can walk on, but it's not used by cars. And uh, that is not bad. You turn right, it's just a innocuous little yellow sign that says there's an off here. And you go and you get on, on the other side of a big berm from the freeway and there's a access road to, I don't know, half a dozen homes back in there. Right. That's not bad. But the place we were uh, last Friday was uh, Farron Road, which uh, was actually quite good. Oh, well. Wow. And that's a lot more convenient. You were one dedicated amateur astronomer. You're almost pro. When do you become a pro? What's a pro? If you're hired, you get paid for it. You get money. You get paid for it. <laughs> I guess Tom Whittemore <laughs> couldn't join us. He's a pro. He ran the uh, the observatory out at Westmont when he worked there. <clears throat> Gentlemen, take care of yourselves and send out a great uh, list of talking points next week. President Jerry, can't wait to see you guys and commiserate with you at Farron Hall or wherever we end up. Tom Totten, you did a great job. Thank you. Give my love to your wives. Bruce, appreciate your uh, getting on board. And Tom Whittemore, get back to us. And maybe Tim Crawford will join us sometime. Uh, that's tomorrow night, right? Are you, any of you going to join him for the workshop telescope? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We can learn how on sbau.org. See okay. you for the podcast. Number 30 coming up next Monday, which should be the 22nd. Good night. Goodbye. And stay, stay safe. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Yeah. And healthy. Keep your mouth <laughs> If 